I think we'll start. Everybody settled in? Yeah. Welcome, welcome everybody. It's really wonderful to see you all. Um, I'm Donna Berman. I'm the executive director of the Charter Oak Cultural Center. And welcome to the opening of Jerusalem between heaven and earth. Um, and again, it's really, really great to see all of you this week before Thanksgiving. I feel grateful uh, for all of you. Uh, before I introduce our esteemed curator and speaker for the night, I want to direct your attention to some exciting Charter Oak events that are coming up. Next Monday night, uh, the 23rd, you're invited to From Charter Oak with Love 2. You may remember that in lieu of our gala, because our gala had to be canceled in, in May, we presented From Charter Oak with Love 1. Also, that was we did that at the end of May. This is the second part. We're going to do it next week. We had hoped we would be able to gather together to honor our Vision Award honorees, Andrea Casper, Jeffrey Green, and Bernadine Silvers, but alas, we couldn't. So From Charter Oak with Love includes our award ceremony and lots of great entertainment and fun stuff. It starts at seven o'clock next Monday night, and we really hope that you can join us. It wouldn't be the same without you. Next Friday night, not this Friday night, but a week from this Friday night, we have our next Read It and Sleep, a family literacy pajama party. We have another gallery opening on Thursday, December 3rd. And a little bit of a surprise, on December 10th, we have a book launch for the children's book that I just published called The Painted Sky. So uh, look for upcoming announcements uh, for details on all of these events. And I hope that you'll, that you'll join us. I hope I can look out again and see your beautiful faces then too. Uh, it's now my honor to introduce uh, our speaker for this evening, the curator of Jerusalem Between Heaven and Earth, Dr. Ori Z. Soltes. Dr. Soltes is Goldman Professorial Lecturer in Theology and Fine Arts at Georgetown University. He is the former director and curator of the B'nai B'rith Kludznik National Jewish Museum in Washington, DC. He earned his BA in philosophy from Haverford College, his MA in classics from Princeton, and his PhD in interdisciplinary studies from Union Institute and University. Professor Saltes is the author of more than 130 articles, exhibition catalogs, essays, and books. It's really too bad he didn't do a lot with himself, but. And he is the writer, director, and narrator of more than 30 documentary vi videos. Among his most recent books are Fixing the World, Jewish American Painters in the 20th Century, which I will be buying after this, Our Sacred Signs, How Christian, Jewish, and Muslim Art Draw from the Same Source, and The Ashen Rainbow, Essays on the Arts and the Holocaust. Professor Soltes has taught and lectured in more than 20 universities and museums nationally on subjects ranging from symbols of faith, art as an instrument of addressing God, to the body in ancient art. Throughout the United States and overseas, he has guest curated ex exhibitions that have focused on diverse aspects of Western art throughout the ages and art from across the world. It's an understatement to say that we are absolutely blessed to have Dr. Saltes with us to guide us through the powerful and beautiful work that comprises Jerusalem between heaven and earth. What a marvelous opportuni opportunity this is to learn from such a brilliant teacher. I want to mention that this lecture tonight, this exhibit is part of the Jewish Art Salon, and that this exhibit and this lecture are part of our celebration, our 19th annual celebration of Jewish arts and culture. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ori Z. Saltes. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Um, remains to be seen whether Donna will feel the same way by the time I'm finished, but it's a good beginning anyhow. Um, and I have to say that the uh, theme, the Jerusalem Biennale always has a theme, and the theme in 2017, um, aside from, uh, the, the theme was watershed. And uh, so the idea of Jerusalem between heaven and earth was um, to suggest the various ways, first of all, in which a watershed is a watershed, and in which Jerusalem can reflect the way in which a watershed is a watershed. So one can speak of a watershed as a kind of branching of sorts. And in a literal geological sense, of course, one understands that, but one can also think of it in historical terms, in theological terms, in aesthetic terms, whether you're talking about the way in which the Hebrew Israelite Judean tradition became a watershed that bifurcated 
into Judaism and Christianity, joined subsequently by another stream called Islam, or whether you're talking about um, the way the abstract expressionists by early the early 1950s had begun a watershed of bifurcation in the direction of actionists on the one hand and chromaticists on the other. But no one here except Joel Silverstein would be bothered with that kind of a thought. So I'll leave it to the side, Joel, and you'll have to take it up later. Um, but of course, Jerusalem itself is a, in a sense, self conceived branching, even going back to the notion of there being two Jerusalems as an early rabbinic idea, the Jerusalem above and the Jerusalem below, the Jerusalem of heaven and the Jerusalem of earth, the Jerusalem that's spiritual and the Jerusalem that's physical. And that plays out in the famous observation made by any number of people, <clears throat> my favorite observer in, in this case being Elie Wiesel, that you know Jerusalem, um, you can find prophets and madmen in equal measure. And of course, often it is the madmen who think they're prophets. And in its history, Jerusalem has had prophets whom Jerusalemites have mistaken for madmen. So it is an inherent kind of watershed conceptually and physiologically, geologically. I mean, how is the original Jerusalem, the old city as it was being developed first as the kingdom of Yevus, Jebus, and then conquered by David by the Israelite capital that he established there after seven years of rule in Hebron. It is, a, it is on an outcropping that comes out of the upper reaches of the Jerusalem plain and around it are no less than three valleys that sweep away from it. And so those three valleys aside from offering a kind of physical image offers a kind of metaphorical reminder of how the faith that evolved from the time in Jerusalem, from the time of David forward, eventually became a threefold faith, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, each with its own particular way of focusing on the city. If you think in just, well, again, physical, physical terms, for Jews, the central address is the remaining wall, ironically enough, of a retaining structure that the king whom no one liked because he wasn't truly a Judean, he was an Idumean and an Abbatean, but his grandfather had embraced the Judean religion. So he was in that sense, kind of sort of Judean, but he wasn't really Herod. He expanded the Temple Mount and what's left is the, re the retaining wall that he added for his expansion, but that's as close in the last give or take 2000 years as Jews can get to the site that would have been or might have been the temple itself. So that's kind of the central address for us. And it is the central address because it's where the temple stood. And it's the central address because of the idea that where the Holy of Holies that's, that in Solomon's temple stood was the place where in a thousand years earlier, the site of Mount Moriah where Abraham offered up his son Isaac was located. And of course, within the rabbinic tradition, there is a further tradition that that in turn was the site where way back at the beginning, you might say of time, as we understand it as humans, Adam built the first, the first altar because Adam, you know, was created on the sixth day. He, when the, when the sun came down, he thought, all right, it was nice being alive for a day, curtains. And he was so thrilled when he woke up the next day, which would have been Shabbat, this beautiful sunny Shabbat, of course, that he built an altar and offered to God a one-horned animal in thanksgiving for being alive. So that site in one of the many threads within the rabbinic tradition is understood to be the site where many, 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 many generations later, Abraham offered up Isaac, which a thousand years later became the site of the Holy of Holies. So for Jews, that's as close as we can get to that is the Western Wall. For Christians, that's not the central address. Sure, the, cell, the Temple of Solomon. Sure, Adam and all that stuff. Sure, Abraham and Isaac and all that stuff in Genesis 22. But really what makes it Jerusalem central for, for Christians is where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre stands because that's understood either to be where Jesus was buried and or to mark the spot where he was crucified because there are at least two different spots that are thought to have been Golgotha but everyone kind of agrees that that's the general site of his tomb. And of course, um, for Muslims, while all of that is well and fine, what's really, really important about Jerusalem 
is the idea that Muhammad took a night journey called the Isra, referenced in the 17th chapter, first verse of the Quran, and then expanded upon in Muslim hadith. And he took it from Mecca to what is taken by the Islamic tradition to have been Jerusalem, and from a rock, which some Muslims understand to be the rock where Abraham offered up Isaac and others where he offered up Ishmael, and from that rock on his talking winged steed Burak, meaning lightning in Arabic, he ascended in what's called the Miraj through the seven heavens, passing by Abraham and Moses and Jesus and others, and ultimately had an audience with God and came back down to that site and then went back to Mecca all in a single night. So each of these traditions, like the three valleys around Jerusalem, take their own kind of paths and even within Jerusalem itself, their particular physical focus is here versus there, there versus here. But of course, they all share Jerusalem in common. And Jerusalem has a threefold history, you might say, of literary inspiration. If we look, for example, in the Jewish tradition, we find it in our liturgy. liturgy. We find it in prose writings. We find it in medieval Spanish Hebrew language poetry. Yehuda Halevi, obviously, as the most famous example, but there are many others, of course. But more than that, it is a threefold source of inspiration, not only for the verbal, but also for the visual, and also for the musical, the oral. So Jerusalem is a watershed in a whole host of different ways. And I might mention uh, three things before turning to look at the works of art that reflect in various ways on all of this. Uh, one is, that the exhibit is laid out differently from the order in which I will offer my comments. Um, so thank, thankfully, Jacques organized a PowerPoint for me that follows the order in which I want to move, which uh, follows, you know, uh, ideas. Second, um, in any number of cases, uh, an artist will have had more than one work of art in the exhibition. I'm only going to talk about one. And because I'm going to talk about one for each of the artists who are included, I will be speaking very briefly, too briefly, about each of the works that I talk about. Um, but, but if there are questions where I can tease things out, I'm happy to do that. And thirdly, in the exhibition is a work by uh, Alexander Kohav that never made it to the exhibit. In the virtual exhibition, I mean, here, you'll see it. But it never made it to the exhibit in Jerusalem because at the last minute, the complications, the logistics of installing it were, were not uh, made it Im uh, impossible. It was a, an installation with a, a series of mannequins hanging, and one of them was painted bright red. And the idea of this was to pun on the idea of Adam, Adam, who means earth, of course. And he's called earth because the redness, Adam, of the earth from which he's made until God breathes some of its spirit into him. Punning on that, and the, and the title of the piece was Adam with the first A in parenthesis, leaving Dam, which of course means blood. So the idea, of course, is Adam, and the idea is blood and all the blood spilled in the city. And the idea is playing on the idea of, the idea is playing on the idea. That's my Department of Redundancy Department. Um, the idea is playing on the idea of Adam's relationship to Jerusalem, not by the way, by way of the uh, rabbinic tradition that I just referenced, but by way of a Christian tradition. Some of you are familiar with the Monastery of the Cross in the, uh, the valley that is off to the west toward the Israel Museum. And it's of course, uh, uh, it was originated by the Georgian church and then it was sold for financial difficulties to the Greek Orthodox Church in I think 1685, but the reason the monastery was built there was because the Georgians were sure that that's where the head of Adam is actually buried. The head is of course where the soul is, so the soul of Adam, and moreover that the tree from which the cross on one, upon which Jesus was sacrificed was at that site. So that's why they built that monastery there. My point yet again is of course uh, we are constantly reminded from various nooks and crannies and ins and outs of um, human creativity of the different range of, range of ways in which Jerusalem has offered itself as a source of inspiration in different directions. So that brings me now to the works of art that are actually present um, in the virtual exhibition that I want to address. And I'll ask um, Jacques if you could throw up the first image. 
And it will be an image beyond this one, which of course is the nice title that he's put together. And we'll move to what I guess one more, one more. God knows we don't need, aha. And we get to Toby Khan and his unpronounceable Y-Y-O-H, yo. It's almost like yud he vav you know, which is not quite pronounceable. And I suspect that's part of his intention, and yet it's not his intention at all. Because if you ask Toby, all of the names of his stuff is, is, is kind of arbitrary, and some of it suggests, but it's not intended to be absolutely definitive about anything. But he did a series for this exhibition of five works, of which I chose this one, because um, it is to suggest in a very abstract, in a very abstract way, the idea of watershed. Uh, I know every time I look at this, I imagine that I'm looking at the way in which the Nile River ends up spreading out when it gets toward the Mediterranean in a delta, and it's not quite what that is. And in fact, that's not what it is at all. It's just the way I happen to read it. And one of the nice things about Toby's abstractions is that you have options as to how to read them. I would point out one further thing, however, if you're not familiar with his work, if this appears to you to be a painting, it is, but deeply embedded, heavily embedded within the pigment is plaster dust so that it is laid on layer by layer by layer and it has a very relief quality to it. So it's very sculptural. But in the end, what we're talking about here, it seems to me is the topography of the idea of Jerusalem and the idea of a watershed in an abstract sense. Next image, please. And one can uh, approach this same idea, but from a completely different angle by looking at this, this is a still, as you can see, it's from a video. So there are two things you're missing here. You can't, one is a, obviously you're seeing a still, you're not seeing motion. The other thing, which is at least as important is you're not hearing anything. And with the video, there is the sound of rushing water. So it's a water-based video, you might say. And one is reminded of the fact, for example, that when David took the city, the instrumentation of so doing was through the single water source into Yevus by way of a spring, the Gihon spring, that was outside the walls, but connected under the walls by an extraordinary passageway that the Jebusites had created, through which one of uh, his lieutenants, finding that, was able to go. And then ultimately, of course, his soldiers could get inside the city and its uh, uncomparable, unconquerable walls, which is how the Jebusites viewed it, suddenly became easily conquered. Um, so water as an important part of its history, and obviously it's a place where water is particularly important. It doesn't isn't come by all that easily. Um, but the other thing you realize is that you're seeing text here and loads of it and pieces of text superimposed and underposed with respect to other texts. So that in a certain sense, you're looking at an abstract landscape of writing made up of Hebrew letters. And of course, that too is appropriate to Jerusalem, particularly if one thinks in abstract terms. It is a landscape that is defined by the Hebrew language, by Hebrew letters. Even the question of what the name means, Yerushalem, and the play and the question of whether it comes from that root, shalom meaning peace. So we have this folk etymology, city of peace, ironic given its history of the last 3,000 years or so, but also etymologically incorrect, because it turns out that Yeru is a Hebrew word that means place of or habitation of, and Shalem is a god of the, uh, the dawn. Shalem and Shachar were these two Canaanite gods of the dawn and the dusk, and clearly the city was under the Jebusites, as every such city would have, been connected to a particular divinity among the many gods and goddesses of the Canaanites, particularly connected to that one. So we've retained the name, ironically enough. Um, so layers of language and layers of letters that are part of the landscape. And if I could have the next slide, please. The installation, and this is an installation shot actually of, of how this looked uh, in the uh, exhibition in Jerusalem. This is a work by Beria Finkel, of course, an installation that is called Salt Mound. And what you can recognize are uh, maybe three things. One, certainly this enormous pile of salt that she's placed in the center of this wonderful space. 
and it's spilling away left, right, and every which way. So it almost fills the space. There's barely enough uh, space for you to walk around the periphery. Two, you have these, these things to, from the right and the left. And if you can see really well, you realize it's like water drips. It's the kind of drip that you would use if you were in a hospital room and you were being fed intravenously. So she's got two of these and there's water from these plastic little containers that are dripping, dripping, dripping slowly, 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 slowly onto the salt. And the idea is to underscore the notion not only of water and its importance, but the difficulty of always having it if one isn't careful about what one does with it when one does have it. And that extends from the mother load of salt water, which is the Dead Sea, all the way across to the Mediterranean Sea, in the middle of which extreme, uh, extent, rather, you have, of course, Jerusalem that was favored by a freshwater spring that made it possible for the Jebusites and in turn the Israelites to establish a city there that um, could survive pretty well under bad conditions. Gihon may come from a root meaning gush, and the idea is that that spring would gush up periodically, reliably, and bring water. And in fact, it still operates that way. A much later tunnel that connected it into the city that was uh, dug by Hezekiah, the Judean king, um, give or take around the year 700. If you have visited that tunnel and walked through it, you want to be through it not at the wrong time because the water suddenly comes up to the level of your hips, which might otherwise be at the level of your knees. So that's still operative. So this play on water and salt, and salt is of course also important, and it's, it's important in our language, the salt of the earth, the salt that we use for our food throughout history. Food that we might not otherwise eat, we can eat because the salt sufficiently alters its taste that if the meat without refrigeration is slightly rotting, we medievalists of the 13th century get used to eating it. We can carry from the idea of kind of geological watersheds to historical watersheds. Next image, please. And if we think of the relationship to Jerusalem and the world uh, around it in historical terms, so David establishes it as the capital of his kingdom, but David is the head of a group that has come to be called a kingdom, preceded in that role by Saul, before whom it was a series of tribes that were governed here and there and loosely and not always as effectively as might be needed, I suppose, by those we call the judges. And before that, led into Eretz Yisrael by Joshua, but led to the watershed border between the wilderness of Sinai or the wilderness in general and crossing the Jordan River into the promised land itself, led, of course, by Moses. So that backtracks us from David three or four hundred years. And the moment of moments, the watershed moment for Moses and the Israelites, of course, or rather watershed moments, plural, are one, coming out of Egypt, they're pursued by the Egyptians, and Moses raising up his staff by instruction from God causes the waters of the Sea of Reeds to part. The Israelites are able to pass through and the Egyptians, of course, are swallowed up by them. And one might perhaps see bifurcating, water shedding the center of this image, a flow, a gush, an, an, an expanse of water that suggests the idea of a sea separating the two parts of this painting by Joel Silverstein. And you can see that he is entitled to 10 commandments in a question because the next moment for the Israelites, ha, just when they're through the Sea of Reeds and they finish praising God for rescuing them, led by Miriam, the sister of Moses, led by a woman, um, I, I emphasize that for a reason in a moment, they next, their next pit stop, of course, is Mount Sinai, where they receive the Ten Commandments, the uh, Ten Instructions, the Ten Abbreviated Caps, um, that stand over what emerge ultimately as 613 do and don't kind of commandments. But of course, it takes Moses 40 days and 40 nights up there on the mountain to get them. And meanwhile, the people are starting to freak out because they've spent 400 years in slavery. They're not kind of used to being alone out in the wilderness thinking for themselves without someone telling them what to do. You all know this story because we retell it, uh, among other times, at Passover year by year by year. But the thing about 
this and Jerusalem is obviously in a very fundamental way, the moment at Sinai and the moment of Moses and the Israelites is an essential prelude to what will become Saul and David and Solomon and the Israelites, not as tribes, but as a kingdom, not wandering through the wilderness, but established with a capital city of Jerusalem. So there is something obviously profoundly important about that, but Jerusalem itself, that bifurcated watershed, um, can be both heaven and earth, as I said at the outset, both prophets and madmen, as I said at the outset. It can be as serious as the day is long, and it can become a cartoon of itself. The madmen in Jerusalem of the 21st century who think they're prophets often have a cartoonish aspect to them. And one of the things that Joel Silverstein loves is cartoons and their applicability to serious subjects that make us rethink what they're about. So probably some of you at least recognize that, of course, he's given us Moses right there. Only, wait, isn't that Charlton Heston's Moses? And there's the Pharaoh, but you should recognize it's Yul Brynner. So this is Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments in part at which we are looking. But it's not just that. We're looking at other characters, whether we are talking about the creature from the, from the, um, the lagoon, um, <clears throat> from a different part of the heritage of the cinema, or whether we're talking about Wonder Woman, who incidentally, in her latest cinematic iteration, as you all know, is, is played by Gal Gadot. She's Israeli. So he's also given us from that past watershed, it's timeless and it's spaceless. Jerusalem conceptually expresses itself, inspires everywhere and through many generations. And in Joel's vision, or rather his revision, we see, as it were, a story which is both happening 3,400 years ago and rehappening in all kinds of diverse ways in our contemporary world, which of course, by the way, in case you've forgotten, is why we celebrate Passover every year with all of these ridiculous gastronomic elements with sometimes very arcane symbolism, which is to make us remember the past as if it's present. It's not what God did for them, it's what God did for me. So Joel just takes that and runs with it in um, a thousand directions all at once. We have moved, as it were, from New York and from Brighton Beach to Jerusalem in one fell colorful sweep. And this is an enormous painting, by the way. So when I say one fell sweep, I really mean one fell sweep. And uh, could I have the next image, please? So the story of Moses, of course, has a starting point. We just saw it at one of the culmination points, uh, a kind of Sinai-esque perspective. And the applicability from past to present also, of course, can play out in different ways. So Pamela Fingerhut's image, which is, of course, not a painting, but a photograph, offers the baby Moses being placed in the reeds by his sister Miriam except we're under no illusion that we're seeing a real baby. We know we're seeing a doll. We know we are seeing not the Miriam of then, but a very contemporary Miriam. In fact, she almost looks with those boots like, well, maybe an Israeli soldier. In which case, we realize that the, the sea of reeds here is who knows where it is. But the point is that the story reiterates itself by way of, by way of visions and revisions in each artist's mind and each artist's eye, and then each art historian can interpret those revisions according to his or her inclinations, as I am, of course, doing right now. Which leads me to the next image, please, Jacques. That brings us both from that time to our own and from Moses, the baby, and Moses at Sinai back to David and beyond David to Solomon, back to Jerusalem in a kind of direct way. This work by Richard McBee, of course, is called Exodus Redux. And what we have here in a manner that is formally, in the formal sense, reminiscent of a gigantic Byzantine icon. In Byzantine icons, you often have the center figure who is the saint, or perhaps it's Jesus on the cross, or Jesus on his mother's lap. 
And then below or sometimes around the whole periphery, you'll have different moments in the life of that particular saint or in the life of Jesus. Now for Richard, of course, what's at the center here? There is no figure at the center of the center because you might say the centerpiece is God and God defies our ability to depict it the way Jesus or various Christian saints can be depicted in a, figur in a figurative way. But what we do have all around the periphery are, and what do we have? It's called excess redux. We have different scenes that relate ultimately to aspects of the story of the Exodus. This is my personal favorite because if you can see, you actually have those seas parted in a walls and people crashing through in the center. So in these colorful um, series, in this colorful series, we see elements of that story but they're also conceived almost as if we're looking at a pair of doors that you can imagine being slid aside or together again in an Aron HaKodesh, in a holy ark in a synagogue. And of course, remember that every holy ark is the lineal descendant conceptually of the ultimate holy ark, the holy of holies, in the temple that Solomon built in Jerusalem. Doorways, perhaps not, a parochet instead, but Many are the contemporary holy arcs, which in addition to a curtain of parochet, have doors, and he's kind of captured that idea. You don't believe me? What do we have here, left and right above? These winged creatures, a variation on the idea of the cherubim that are referenced in 1 Kings 6 of Solomon's temple, but then have their own visual history over the millennia that follow between the time of Solomon and our own. More than that, you realize there are also a number of ancillary scenes that come about in a grisaille, kind of black and white format, that complement the colorful scenes that are the centerpiece that derive from the rabbinic tradition that after all operates um, in that manner to commentary, to comment on, to embroider on, to expand on the uh, essential issues that we find in the Bible. Whether we're talking about Midrash, that takes a particular passage and then comments on it, or whether we're talking about Talmud, which starts with a particular issue and then discusses it often with reference to the Bible. And yes, someone has made the observation that it also looks, and I agree with you, like a piece of film back in the old days when we used to have film and not just video. Um, in which case, what Richard has to do is stand there and rush it by you at a certain speed so it will become active. But I think it's active enough as will. Could I have the next uh, image, please, Jacques? So we've moved in, into the context of the Bible from geology to Moses, to David, to Solomon. And Solomon, of course, by Jewish tradition, is the author of a number of books that end up filling out what becomes the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. One of them being Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, this book of wisdom. And what you're staring at here is this wonderful oil painting by Ellen Holtzblatt, which takes on a passage in uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 2, which says in part, before the sun, the light, and the moon grow dark, and the clouds return after the rain. That's just part of it, right? So she's called this before the sun, the light, and the moon. And she's given us a revision of that turn of phrase, associated with, ascribed to, the king of Jerusalem who financed the temple, or rather who taxed the Israelites in order to finance the temple. But she's given us a landscape that I think we can readily enough identify as non-Jerusalemic. It looks like New England. It could be any number of places. We understand the skies. We understand the clouds. We understand the moon, the light, the sun. We understand those ideas. But what we really understand is another revision of the universalism, the universality of Jerusalem, that I can look through my eyes as an artist or as a thinker at any landscape and find Jerusalem in it. And she's inspired to see, to read Kohelet in this landscape, which makes it universalistic. Next image, please. And of course, within the Hebrew Bible, there is no prophetic book, perhaps, more universalistic than the book of Jonah. After all, Jonah is told by God to go prophesy in, uh, to, in Nineveh, which is the capital of the Assyrians, 
the Assyrian Empire. They're the ones who destroyed the Israelite north. The lost 10 tribes are lost thanks to the Assyrians. That's the last place he wants to go to help these people out to clean up their moral and ethical act. And of course, he tries to run away from God, doesn't he? He sets sail for what is referred to in that text as Tarshish, which is probably not the name of a real place, um, but that's another story for another, for another day. And he, he finds himself on board ship and the ship and a storm comes up, of course, the ship is, is gonna go down and he's the one who among all of the various passengers on the ship says, it's cause of me, just dump me overboard and believe me, the seas will calm down. And the non-Israelite captain doesn't wanna do that because he feels it's morally irresponsible. And Jonah says, don't worry about me, I'll be okay. So he throws him overboard and of course the seas come. And as you all know, Jonah is swallowed up by something some great fish or something like that, for three days, three nights, a kind of death and when he is spat up onto the beach resurrection. And this is an, a, an extraordinary uh, work by uh, Jonah Ferver and Katarzyna Kozera, the book of Jonah. Of course, it's the book of Jonah. It's also punning on Jonah Ferver's own name, Jonah, and on her own experience as someone who came from the Netherlands, who ends up in New York, I do believe I see the Brooklyn Bridge there, all under the eyes of a kind of all-seeing, is it, kind of God, but we don't want to be too literal about that. It's haunting, it's mysterious, and during the exhibition, uh, Jonah provided a, uh, an iPad, and you could, using the iPad, actually see all kinds of other things going on underneath the surface of this painting that connected to the story of transformation, of going from one tradition to the other, from one country to the, the other, from going over the water and like this submarine under the water and um, emerging as a different kind of person. Who, who knew that she'd end up as the head of, founding head of the Jewish art salon? Next image, please. So Jonah inspired a number of, of, of the artists in this work, John Greenfield, um, has taken the belly of the beast, and and I mentioned that Jonah gets spat up onto the uh, the the sands of the of uh, the shore, and uh, once again will be confronted with God by his uh, call, which is to go prophesy to the uh, Ninevites. And for her, she is taking it very personally. This is herself that is pouring out of a moment of personal transformation at a certain time, in a certain place, under certain circumstances, this uh, multimedia that deals with pictures and pictures, as it were, of self transformed and changed. Next image, please. And sim symptomatic of the way in which the Bible as a kind of ultimate textual accompaniment to Jerusalem as the ultimate center of watershed change, transformation, and diversity. The photo uh, by Alan Hobscheid um, called the boat puns, it seems to me, on a couple of things. He intends it on the one hand to be, as it were, Jonah, who is setting sail, but not on a big ship, but on a little boat heading for Tarshish. But on the other hand, it is a contemporary Arab figure who is doing that. So the whole history of Jerusalem's relationship to the Arab culture that we can understand in art historical terms, carrying all the way back over 100 years to the founding of the Batsalel Art School in 1906, and particularly as the head of that school, Boris Schatz, wore through the end of the 20s a long flowing robe and a kafia in order to associate himself with the indigenous population because he saw in that population throwbacks to the time of Abraham and to the time of David and to the time of all those biblical characters whom he imagined and we imagined wearing these long flowing robes. So this is once again, by way of the idea of Jonah, a revision of something which has a biblical beginning point and carries through to the present day. Next image, please. Water and water and water. Gabriela Boros did a, a number of these very handsome uh, woodcuts. I'm just showing you one of them. Um, and you can see the water shall dry up, but if you can read very well, you realize it's a double uh, passage from the Bible. The waters 
of the sea shall dry up and the rivers will drain and parch. But then three verses later, uh, we talk about um, the fishermen who will be mourning. And that's in part what we see here as we see the parching of the landscape. And what is this all about? I think it's about, as it was for the prophets, a warning. That's the context. If you And what was the context for the prophets, for Isaiah, for Jeremiah, for Hosea, for Amos, for all of them? One way or another, the Israelites, the Judeans, have to clean up their moral and ethical acts, or they're going to piss off God and things are not going to go well for them. And of course, when the first temple that Solomon had built is ultimately destroyed, well after Hezekiah in building, in digging that, that tunnel for water underneath, had managed to keep Jerusalem out of the Assyrian hands when the Assyrians took all the northern tribes away, as it were. But a generation and a half later, of course, well, I'm sorry, a generation after the Assyrians were overthrown by the Babylonians, it's over a century after Hezekiah, um, Jerusalem falls, the temple is destroyed. And that's when the Judeans realize, oh, you know, all that stuff Jeremiah was telling us recently about not oppressing the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, gosh, maybe we should have been listening. God punished us. And there was at the same time a conviction that if we turn back to God, God will turn back to us, because that's also what Jeremiah said. So this is a kind of warning, it seems to me, that the waters will dry up, the fishermen shall mourn if um, we don't live up to the commandments. And therefore, next image, the work by Rachel Cantor picks up that idea in a completely different medium. This is again, a nor an enormous um, textile work. Um, and it's titled, as you can see in front of you, Wake Up. And the idea of course, is that we need to wake up or we perish. And notice two things about this in, in this semi-abstract depiction of what one could construe on the one hand as any number of watersheds. One can also under, under, uh, view this as any number of trees. And if one looks at it uh, in the latter way, then if you move from left to right through each of the three panels, you kind of move from winter or autumn, late autumn through winter to spring, summer, that is to say, from trees devoid of any kind of vegetation to a richly vegetal kind of landscape. So think of that way, of that potential for transformation that underscores this conviction that the Judeans felt in exile, that they could return if they returned to God and God returned to them. And of course, only 47, 48 years later, Cyrus the Great of Persia had overthrown the Babylonians and not only allowed, but invited and assisted the Judeans to go back and to begin to rebuild their temple. But the other thing is, I find it interesting that she has created it as a kind of triptych. And it always strikes me when Jewish artists do triptychs that one of two things may be going on. On the one hand, it can be an allusion to the triptych form in the history of Western art, the last 18 or so centuries of which is largely Christian art, and a comment on the position of Jews within the Christian world particularly when we're talking about the post-Holocaust world, the Christian God of mercy, where was he when six million Jews were being slaughtered, when a million Jewish children were being fried in ovens um, between 1940 and 1945, give or take, so that there is often that kind of an intention. But on the other hand, and I think this may be more to the point in Rachel Cantor's case, there are all kinds of triunities within the prophetic books, such as on three things, the world doth stand, on Torah, on service, on good works. We subdivide ourselves for liturgical purposes into three components, Kohanim, Leviim, and Yisrael. There are a zillion different ways in which threeness uh, plays an important role within our tradition that centers in a very fundamental way around Jerusalem and the prophets who were prophesying there which carries me from the biblical to the rabbinic, if I could have the next image, please. Because out of the Bible and within it, the Torah, and out of the commandments that fill out the Torah and which are expanded and expounded upon by the prophetic uh, works and post-prophetic works, 
in the rabbinic tradition, we end up with a whole series of instructions of things we ought to do in order to be doing the things we're supposed to do. So for example, as we approach the new year and we seek to cleanse our souls or at least to examine them regarding what, what we've been during the previous year to prepare for a new year, and we have a kind of double directed way in which we do that because we spend time in the synagogue and we spend time at the end of the days of awe fasting for 25 hours to deal with God. But meanwhile, you're also supposed to spend that time dealing with your fellow humans. If I've done something to offend someone, praying to God all I want is not gonna help. I've gotta to speak to that person. So it's a, simul it, it's a constant simultaneously bivalent approach to the idea of cleansing oneself. And then just as at Passover, we eat certain substances to symbolize the experience of the Israelites coming out of Egypt and moving through the wilderness to the promised land. So during the high holy days, we also engage in actions that offer a symbolic kind of um, connotation of what we are doing spiritually, tashlich, sending away, sending away our sins. It can be a group process. So communities will take little pieces of bread and together by the riverside. You who live in New York have done it either on the East River or the Hudson River. We who live in Washington have done it in the Potomac. We have tossed pieces of bread as symbolic statements of tashlich, of sending away our sins. But Beth Krens Krensky came up with a different sensibility there because even as it's a group effort where we reinforce each other, it's also a single effort that each of us has to do as it were in a fundamental way alone because only I know what my sins were and only you know what your sins were in the previous year. And that, it seems to me, she's shown in a very unique sort of manner. She has depicted herself in a video, and she is barefoot going down this long, lonely, dusty road, leading a kind of little four-wheeled nothing, right? It's a wagon with, has, which has everything on it and nothing on it, bearing the burden into the hills. And I might add one further detail about this. The Jerusalem Hills? No, my children. This is Utah, which is where she lives underscoring once again this principle that Jerusalem can be wherever you find it because of its importance and its connotations and not only confined by those three valleys in that particular place, but defined in a range of different ways. Next image, please. And Ben Schachter offers another kind of visual rabbinic discussion that puns and plays back with that subject of water. It's aqua vita, although you'll notice it is intentionally, as it were, mirrored. It's backwards like Leonardo, right? And what's aqua vit? Water of life, water that causes life. And if you look carefully, you'll notice there are two particular components here. One, you might be able to identify steps going down as some form of a mikvah. And on the other hand, below you can see all these, all this um, scientific apparatus. So one might say that analogous to Jerusalem above and Jerusalem below, we've got water that is being played with both in the scientific sense and the question of science versus faith and faith versus science and the question of what water is scientifically and in the spiritual sense, which is the purpose of the mikvah, that purification under which we go every week before Shabbat every month after menses, every time we get married, all 50 times we get married, right? So before, before, married, before marriage, we are purified. And there are very precise prescriptions, as you all know, in the rabbinic tradition for exactly how one defines a proper mikvah. It's about as scientific as, well, all the stuff you see going on below here. Next image, please. So a kind of subset of the rabbinic tradition in which at the same time you might say is in opposition <clears throat> to its legalistic um, personality is the mystical tradition. The Jewish tradition of Kabbalah that in fact grows out of Merkava and pushes towards Hasidut. And Susan Schwalb's wonderfully abstract Harmonizations 14, if you look at it, you realize two things. One, in terms of art history, I think back to those chromaticist abstract expressionists 
who in believing that some of them, believing that color had ceased to be useful, started to do black paintings, except it turns out that black is a color. And no two colors in this colorless, color-filled work, no two spaces are the same. There is an infinite range in which these can go. But it turns out the number of them is not just infinite, it's precise, there are 36 of them. And within the mystical, the Jewish mystical tradition, of course, 36 is a very important number. It's twice 18, 18 is the symbol of life, chai, because of the numerology of the Hebrew letters. But it also attaches itself to an idea that there is a succession of tzaddikim, of righteous ones, just ones, because of whom, in spite of all of its flaws imposed by us humans, the world is permitted by God to continue to survive. There's one in every generation. Often they're hidden. We don't necessarily who, know who they are. They can walk down the street and we think, ah, that's nobody. And that turns out to be the tzaddik, one of the lamed vavniks, one of the lamed vavniki, one of the 36. So she's punning and playing on that idea. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please. And in a very different way, Carol Buckman also, you might say, has as one of her starting points, the whole idea of where Jewish mysticism starts its attempt to become closer and closer to God, which is what every mystic wants. Every mystic wants to become one with God, to become filled with God. In order to become filled with God, I've got to empty myself of self. And if I want access to God, how can I get access to God that is not accessed by the five senses, by the intellect, by ordinary garden variety uh, emotions, by ordinary garden variety prayers, maybe even, by God's name, God's name, which does and doesn't tell us anything and everything about God, which is what we see her writing in Hebrew, yud heh vav -he, in black on the white in the center of this image. When Moses asks God, point blank in Exodus 3.14, oh, by the way, who shall I say sent me? When the Israelites ask me who sent me, who shall I say? And God says, well, you know, I am, but will be that I am, will be. And Mo is like confused. And then God has, has uh, Rochmona, see his pity on Moses. And the Israelites says, look, just tell them it's the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They'll get it. But the point is, what was God talking about? God's answer to Moses is, you cannot define me, confine me, which is what a name does because it seeks to present the essence of its bearer. Because I am isness itself. And it turns out that yud heh vav -he, the name that we offer as a standard issue name for God by way of those Hebrew consonants is built on the root of the verb to be. So it, you could translate it as isness. Moreover, it turns out that in Hebrew, there are only two tenses for that verb. You can talk of that which is done, perfectus in Latin, right? Perfect, and that which is not done. So the past is done, the present and the future are undone. And God says, I am will be that I am will be using the present future because there's no border there. It's ongoing. I am ongoing isness itself, Mo. You can't confine and define me by name the way you're confined and defined by your name. And the guy someday you're going to choose as your acolyte, Joshua, is going to be defined by name. It doesn't work that way with me. So the mystic, of course, is seeking by way of God's name to get closer access to God, even realizing that the name is not the same as God itself. If I say Abraham Lincoln, it's not as if he walked into this room, but yet there's a sense we have as if he did, you might say, particularly if Abraham Lincoln were living here among us. But within the mystical tradition, the Jewish mystical tradition, late Kabbalah and into early Hasidut, the letters that make up God's name, the letters that make up the Torah that is God's word, only give us partial information about what we seek. We have to seek between the letters. And so the white spots between the black letters, and I believe she's punning on this idea, is part of how we try to access God. And one might say that she is imprinting, embedding God in the earth itself, 
an earth which is, as you can see, filled with salt once again. We've circled in a certain sense back to Buria Finkel's work. Earth and heaven, God and the salt of the earth itself, and the artist as a kind of sacerdotal figure, a kind of priestess in this sense, intermediating the way Jerusalem intermediates between realms. Next image, please. Further underscoring the way in which Jerusalem is carried in our hearts from the moment the Jews are forbidden by Hadrian in the aftermath of the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132-135 to enter Jerusalem. And after Hadrian's death, three years later, his successor Antoninus Pius rescinded those decrees, but Hadrian had already raised, R-A-Z-E-D, what was left of the temple from the destruction 65 years earlier, and built on it a temple to capital on Jupiter, and renamed the city, Aelia Capitolina, associating with the pagan Roman gods. So for centuries, it wasn't a place that had the same kind of physical attraction that it had had for the Jews coming out of the Hebrew, Israelite, Judean tradition. It couldn't. But everywhere they went, of course, it was carried in the liturgical tradition, the poetic tradition, the visual tradition. And Jerusalem offers itself as a watershed, particularly during watershed moments in Israelite, Judean, Jewish history. So this is one of Mark Podwell's contributions to the exhibition. And you can see it's the expulsion 1492. It's talking about the expulsion from Spain, a diaspora from within the diaspora of this Fardin, um, and you can see that on one of those ships, a very Columbus-like ship, you can see the Torah scrolls being carried because the point is, wherever we are and wherever we settle and from wherever we're exiled and wherever we're exiled to, we carry with us the Torah. That's our Jerusalem. Embedded within it are all the principles that Jerusalem in a very particular concrete sense may be meant to exemplify, but in spite of our obsession with it, is something we actually can, in a certain sense, do without as long as we have the Torah with us. I remind you, at the time of the revolt, uh, when Jerusalem was on the verge of falling in the year 70, so 65 years before Hadrian, Yochanan ben Sakai was carried in a coffin out of Jerusalem, went to the besieging Roman general Vespasian, who later became emperor, and asked to establish an academy at Yavne on the coast there, because he understood that ultimately it would be our traditions, rabbinic and otherwise, that would carry for us Jerusalem wherever we went. Next image, please. And it isn't always the case that others do us in. We sometimes do ourselves in. So Bill Sussman from uh, the Netherlands uh, did a, a, a couple of works that are abstract sculptures, but it's about Espinosa, the Marrano of reason. Espinosa, Spinoza, whose family came from, well, not Spain, but Portugal, and who, born in the 17th century, so 140 years or so after the expulsion from Spain, into the Sephardic community of Amsterdam, where he ended up being spat out, exiled from the community, the Cherem by its rabbinic leadership because of their perception that his views were heretical. Um, so you might say influenced by the same uh, inquisitional authorities that had persecuted Jews in Spain and then led to the expulsion, the Sephardic leadership did the same for Spinoza, but he's a watershed, not only in the sense of carrying that sensibility into the Jewish tradition, but because he's also regarded as the father of modern thinking. So he's a watershed between the medieval, ancient and medieval worlds on the one hand and modern thought on the other hand. Next image, please. And Archie Rand, um, in one of his contributions to the exhibition, 1946, of course, is reflecting on the Holocaust. You look at the shoe and you can't not remember the old woman and the shoe, right? Who had so many children, she didn't know what to do. So all of those typical renditions of that image, a shoe with an entrance, with a made into a house, has kids running all over the place. You'll notice there are no kids here. 
you'll notice that there is what looks like a destroyed city with perhaps fire rising there. That ain't no sunset or sunrise, that's fire. But we understand with the yellow star right dead center of the composition that this is all of those children whom I mentioned earlier on, a million of them, fried in ovens during a cataclysm which clearly represents for today's jury the most extraordinary watershed in our history in the most negative of ways that one can imagine. Um, and we can see that if I could have the next image, please, Jacques, expressed from a different angle by Martin van der Heiden, um, another Dutchman uh, like Bil Bilha also from, from the Netherlands, who did a whole series of 14 stations of the cross, which in the exhibition in uh, Jerusalem, I set up so it looked actually like the Stations of the Cross. And I'll show you in a few moments what was at the center, what you got there in lieu of the crucified Christ. But what Martin did, if you look carefully, you realize, talk about Jerusalem above and Jerusalem below, talk about heaven and earth. How about hell and heaven? What you've got are concentration camp images in black and white below in each of them. This particular one, number nine, is called Ecce Homo, an ironic pun on that Latin turn of phrase, which is associated with the Roman legionnaire Longinus, who at the time of the crucifixion, as a pagan who had been part of the process of leading through the suffering of Jesus to Golgotha and his crucifixion, it's kind of, oh my God, I didn't realize, I suddenly realized now, behold the man, he is truly something special, this revelation. And you'll notice that this, this victim of the Nazis has his arms stretched out in death like Christ, that above that in color is one or another image from the Western Christian tradition with its beautiful aesthetic focus on Jesus and those around him. And this particular one, you're just seeing it from the bottom, is the Christ risen from the tomb. So he's soaring upwards so fast that we can't even capture all of him uh, in the upper reaches of the image that has been recreated by um, Martin van der Heiden in order to address this topic of um, beauty and ugliness, of creation and destruction, of history and art history and watersheds. Next image, please. And so yet from another angle, as we remind ourselves that the threefold Abrahamic progeny of Jerusalem, um, includes Judaism and includes Christianity, includes Islam. Miriam Stern did a series of these rather fascinating Crusader Bible images. The Crusaders, for those of you who have forgotten your history, are those who came in the first place at the end of the 11th century, 1096 through nine, um, to liberate Jerusalem and the Holy Land to make it free for pilgrims, Christian pilgrims. And when the Crusaders, got to Jerusalem, which they did and liberated it in 1099, as Geoffrey of Bouillon, who is one of the four leaders of the Crusaders, ebulliently uh, um, mentioned in his writing, in his letters, um, the blood of Jews and Muslims was fl flowing through the, through the streets of Jerusalem at such a level that it was up to the haunches of my horse. So, a kind of religio side genocide in the, the interests of liberating the city is the legacy of that first crusade. And there is a, a, a Bible that is known as the Crusader Bible because it's associated with that period and images. It's a Christian Bible with its own revisualization of the, uh, of the te text uh, in imagistic form. And, and so what we've got here, of course, is a Christian Bible that has been revisioned by a Jewish artist, taking little pieces and parts of it in each of her images to highlight them. If I could have the next image, please. And of course, for Islam as well, Jerusalem is important. And one of Siona Benjamin's rather spectacular works is a whole series that is associated with Exodus. This is, of course, Exodus 5. Its subtitle is Janat. Janat is the Arabic word for heaven. Think of the cognate with the Hebrew gan, as in gan Eden, gan Eden janat. So it is, she raises the question throughout the series, how is the concept of 
of paradise, of the Garden of Eden, similar and dissimilar between Judaism and Islam. And among the elements in this work that she has framed with this marvelous marbling technique, that as a technique originated in the Muslim world, it was actually the Ottoman Turks who developed it. Developed it. The Ottoman Turks also made use of these kinds of cloud images that they got from the Persians who got them from India, which happens to be where Siona comes from. The Indians got them in turn from China. That's where that particularized way of, of uh, stylizing clouds begins. But what's most interesting to me here, of course, is this wonderful bird, which we can recognize as, well, we might call it a bird of paradise. We might recognize it within the Muslim tradition as the, uh, the simurg, that in Persian and in Turkish is the bird that is understood in the metaphor of the Persian epic poem by Attar, the conference of the birds, to be the symbol of God. There's only one of them. And they go to seek him. And when they find him, what they find in his throne room is an empty throne with a mirror. And they are looking at themselves in the mirror because God is they and they are God. And in Persian, there's a nice pun because Simurg means 30 and there are 30 birds looking in the mirror there. Of course, we also have other variants on this in other traditions. You have the firebird in the Slavic tradition. You have the phoenix in the Greek tradition. So what Siona typically does and what she is doing here is in fact not limiting herself to the dialogue of Judaism and Islam, but the dialogue of Judaism and Islam within the much larger polylogue that involves a range of different cultures and traditions. Next image, please. And if we bring things finally toward the, the contemporary world, we arrive at it by way of a number of, of different paths. This is an installation, you're seeing the installation shot itself from the exhibition, of a, uh, of a, a slew of letters. You can see that some of them are Latin letters, English, some of them you can recognize as Hebrew, some of you may be able to recognize some of them as Arabic. And this work by Aviva Shemer references the idea toward the early 20th century of Martin Buber that Jerusalem would be an appropriate capital for the eternal people, the Am Olam, and that as such, it had to serve all peoples. So it could be a capital that was shared by Jews, by Christians, and Muslims, and not one claimed by one or the other tradition for itself alone. Next image, please. And the complications that, of course, set in from that time to our own are reflected in part uh, in this work by Jane Logeman, that, as you can see, it's called water, Hebrew, water, Arabic, and what's going on here? She has the word for water, ma'im, in Hebrew, 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 in Arabic, 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 Arabic. So she has created a kind of perfect circle with blue, the color of the sky, the color of truth. And at the center of the circle, you might say a watershed, right? It's the color of the sky. It's also this color of the water in an ideal sense that separates the Hebrew from the Arabic, but it's the same word, virtually the same word in these two related languages. They, we have the same needs. And so it is intended, it's part of a larger series of works um, that are bilingual, that seek a kind of rapprochement between culture A and culture B, and in this case, specifically, the uh, Israeli and the Palestinian culture, the Jewish and the Muslim culture, and so on and so forth. Next image, please. And this was the image that I mentioned when I said I set up Martin van der Heiden's 14 Stations of the Cross and they came to center on an image. This was the image that I chose to be the center. This is not the crucified Christ, it's a little boy. And if you don't know the backstory, there's a kind of inherent poignancy to it, but you don't really know what's going on. Even perhaps by the title, A Drop in the Bucket. If you do know the backstory, which is, the desperation with which, and he's a Palestinian boy, the Palestinians seek out water because there is such an enormous imbalance between the supply of water that they have access to and the supply of water to which the Israelis have access, including digging beneath the surface into the aquifer because guess what? There is loads of water underneath the surface of Eretz Israel. You just have to access it. Well, you can access it with a well that goes straight down, but it takes a different kind of technology to do that in an angle. And the Israelis have that technology, which means literally 
that water from Tel Aviv may be coming from under Ramallah. And Ramallah is not getting all the water that is beneath the surface of Ramallah. It's, some of it is going to Tel Aviv, or as the case may be to Jerusalem. So this is a, a reference to the importance of water in and around Jerusalem, west and east, in the world of which Jerusalem is the center, and the problems of dealing with it. On the other hand, next image, please. This extraordinary painting by Le Arab, um, which is called the Valley of Tears, you might say in a very literal sense, as abstract as it is, you can recognize those hills, you can recognize the horizon, but the whole landscape is filled with a different liquid. This is blood, this isn't water, or perhaps one can at least see it that way. And we understand that the allusion is to not just Valley of Tears as a kind of turn of phrase, it's a particular place during the Yom Kippur War, at the advent of which it appeared that Israel might be wiped off the map. And if you think about that time period and the outside world, it looked as if the outside world was gonna shrug its shoulders like the outside world did between 1940 and 45 and did in part in 1967. And here in 73, it looked perilously close for the Israelis. Um, and that's the reference here. And if I could have the next image, please. And on, uh, on the other hand, we can shift from water to blood to fire because this work by Yehudis Barmatz Harris um, which as you can see is a video still, which is called Let It Burn, is a detail here of a process through which she physically burnt a whole pile of her own art, her own drawings. So there's a personal element here, but at the same time, particularly as we zoom in on it, it references the whole idea of fire as it pertains to the Shoah, to the Holocaust. The fire that consumed humans, but I remind you that began with the consumption of books and the burning of books in the center of Berlin was a prof prophecy beginning its fulfillment from 120 years earlier, from 1821, from Heinrich Heine, the poet who had said, those who begin by burning books end up by burning humans. But this image is intended not only to reach back there, but to reach further back to the Hasidic tradition of burning, but burning for fervor with God. Remember I said, even ordin ordinary garden variety prayers won't be sufficient for gaining access to God for the mystic. In Hasidut, the term is hit lahavut, enthusiasm, but the center of that word lahav is flame. So I must be inflamed when I pray if I want access to God. But her image in fact carries further back than that to the history of Jerusalem itself to the burning of not one, but two different temples, 600 years apart on two different occasions under two different sets of circumstances. And yet it goes further back than that to where we began in the wilderness with Joel Silverstein and the whole idea of Moses and the children of Israel and they're freaking out and not doing what they were supposed to do. And there's that moment where they need to be purified. And the burning of the red heifer is the process of group purification. So it turns out that this very personal video has ramifications and implications. It's a watershed for a whole series of conceptual, theological, and historical moments that carry all the way back to the beginning of the beginning of the Israelites. And conversely, next image, please. This is one of several paintings by Mayan that um, is a reference to the burning of her own studio and what that meant as a watershed in her life as an artist and her building herself up from the beginning again, Jerusalem as a reshaping, as a place of being reborn, as a place that is reduced to fire and ash to black and white, but at the same time, and her subsequent work becomes more and more colorful, pulls color out of the darkness. Next image, please. And so the personal, and the whole idea of transformation and rebirth and how we understand ourselves and how the world works is expressed by Sarah Lightman uh, in the video of which again, we're disadvantaged by not seeing the whole process of this glass developing and its text with it. But even here we get an idea of 
half full, half empty, half empty, half full. It is an analog to Jerusalem. Half this, half that. Half spiritual, half physical. Heaven above, earth below. Part of this tradition, part of that tradition. Part of what is personal for me, part is, of what is part of my people, part of what is part of humankind. And this leads me to one last image, please, Jacques, by Elaine Langerman, which is in fact called Watershed. And it's from a, a series that she did in which she responded in visual terms to a poem. So you can see there is a poem that is recorded along the sides here. And she is reflecting on that in visual terms. So I saved this image for the last because it seems to me that it takes us all the way back even beyond where we began to the beginning of the beginning, which is through all those centuries beginning with Moses at Sinai and the various commandments that included one about not making images, but if you read it closely, it's not about making them. It's about not making them for the purposes of worship. It's not about worshiping them. It's about not making idols. It's not about not making images. And so that assumption that it was about making and not just worshiping images has led through many parts of Jewish geography and history, of course, away from visual images or away from the assumption that Jews could make visual images. Because after all, we're people of the book. We're people of texts. Well, it turns out we're both. And particularly in the last, well, since Bitzalel, and even earlier than that, we have, incre with increasing vehemence, ex ex uh, accelerating and crescendoing in the last two generations with enormous depth and breadth, uh, we've shown ourselves to be a very intense and rich people of images, which doesn't mean we left behind being a people of texts. So this work is both. It's, it's both text and image. And um, within the context of Jerusalem, um, it is about all of the different directions that a particular idea can end up leading us. And in the case of Jerusalem, as a source of inspiration, it is a kind of metaphor for the various directions in which that source of inspiration has led us over time and space. I'm happy to entertain questions. So I guess you can get rid of the last image, Jacques, and it brings us all of our faces back on. Any questions? Yes, please. Um, Alexandra, I see your hand raised. So can you unmute yourself? No, I guess uh, Jacques, you have to do that. Now, now try unmuting yourself. He's just allowed you. Go ahead. It wasn't really a question. It was more of a thought um, how diverse these uh, different mediums were yes. and yet expressing the very same concepts the same ideas and taking us back to our history our roots our rich um, yes uh, imprint on the on the world if you will yes well art itself of course can be a, a watershed <laughs> And um, one of the ways in which it is, as you say, is through media. There are just so many different media through which uh, ideas can be expressed that uh, interlace each other very eloquently. And certainly, I mean, think about this. This was a, a mere uh, 30 artists, right? 30 works of art. And that's mm -hmm. just a drop, apropos of water, a drop in the bucket of the range and variety uh, of just Jewish artists. And some of these were not Jewish, by the way, a couple of them were not, um, but Jewish artists. And of course you can expand out from that, Jewish artists, Christian artists, Muslim artists, Hindu artists. I mean, yeah, it's part of what, it's part of why Plato is wrong when he uh, sneers at art in books three and 10 of the Republic because he sees it as nothing but imitation. And art is never imitation, it's revision it's what the artist sees in the objective world out there and filters through the artist's subjective brain and eye and hand to produce what he or she or they produce. Um, yeah, this was just a nice symptom of, of that truth. Anyone else? Miriam? Yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, be in Jerusalem 
for the yes, you were. audio. And also, he was very helpful, in fact, at the time of the installation. So there. And, uh, and also the smaller exhibition in, uh, in Riverdale. But I have to say that tonight, I really gained so much from your explanations and thoughts and ideas that um, never occurred to me when I was there. And it just, I wanna thank you because it opened up hmm. a whole different world, I think for all of us. Well, thank um, you. And for me particularly, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, at the time of the exhibition, first of all, it was a challenge because of, of the politics of religion and the religion of politics in Jerusalem, so that we had to separate it into two different locations. And that made the, the, the thematic flow that I would have preferred much more difficult to engage. And there was no opportunity uh, because it was part of a, a Jerusalem Biennale. So there were uh, a dozen different exhibitions opening at the same time. So there was really no opportunity to talk about anything. And the catalog, which overall is very extensive, yet for each exhibition is very minimal. So, and, and the funny thing is I've, I was re-looking at the, at the essay that I wrote and there, um, there's stuff that, that because it was based on what I thought someone was going to do and the artist ended up doing a different work from the one that I described in half a sentence. So yes, I very much appreciate the opportunity and thank you, Miriam, I really do appreciate it. Any other questions sure. or comments? Is that Elaine Langerman, is that, is your hand up? Okay, unmute yourself, darling, please. You're still muted, you're still muted. There you go. Oh, sorry, I'm technologically challenged. What can I say? At any rate, thank you very much. Um, I love the way all the, the work just, um, Hinged together and how you were able to connect all the concepts. It's really lovely. And thank, thank you, you for saving my work for last. <laughs> I was very honored. And Miriam, I, I wrote, totally agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ori? Yes. Can you say something about the Jewish Art Salon? And how, this, and how this exhibit came together too? Uh, yes, I can, although I feel less equipped to talk about the Jewish Art Salon than perhaps Yona or Joel or Richard McVie, but I'll, I'll say a few words, and if they want to add something, they can and should. Um, uh, it, it was organized really to create a forum, both in visual and in verbal and conceptual terms, for considering the whole realm and idea of, of Jewish art and the various ways in which um, artists can be comfortable with that rubric and not uh, terrified by it, which um, even today there are artists who are, but certainly a generation ago, there were many more Jewish artists who were. I did an exhibit at the, at, in 2000, I think it was, called Jewish Artists Colon On The Edge. And I remember uh, two artists in particular who might ask if they'd be part of it who wouldn't because they didn't want to be part of an exhibit that had the word Jewish in the title. Mm. Um, and I won't say who they were, fairly substantial artists. I mean, it really would have been a, a boon for me and the exhibition. So, uh, and, and in fact, when I ran the Klesnik Museum and I did an exhibition that involved the work of Morris Lewis, Morris Lewis's widow was on my board and I thought she'd be very helpful. She turned out begrudgingly to be a little bit helpful, but not as much as I thought to get some Morris Lewis's for that exhibition. And she had me change the name of the exhibition cause she didn't, I forget what I called it, but again, she was uncomfortable that if Morris's name were in an exhibition that said something like Jewish art, it would somehow limit him. This guy you understand whose paintings are in every major museum on the planet. And yet she was worried about that. And she created the museum studies program at George Washington University. So this is also someone who is herself an educator. So that kind of discomfort, I would say, in a nutshell, the Jewish Art Salon was created to deal with that, recognizing that so many artists are not uncomfortable anymore, and so they should be front and center, but also creating a, a mechanism for those who think they still are uncomfortable to cease being so uncomfortable. 
As for, and Joel or, or Richard or Yona might want to add to that. As for the exhibition itself, um, it was actually uh, Yona and Richard who asked me if I would curate it, if I would curate an, an exhibition so-called. And um, they sent out a call for, for works of art and they actually did a kind of preliminary culling. And then I came up to New York and we looked at everything together. Um, and uh, there were very few points of disagreement, um, but they honestly, they were my co-choosers. Um, and uh, then I went home and, and sort of started writing, putting it together. Um, and then we all converged on Jerusalem, you know, a, a week or so before the exhibition was supposed to start. And Joel was there and Richard was there and Miriam was there and, and um, uh, Yehudis was there, um, uh, you know, people who live there and people who came uh, who were enormously helpful in uh, actually hanging it because um, I tend to hang things. I mean, that's not typically the curator's role, but because I directed a museum where I had a staff that was minimal, I, I always sort of designed and hung the exhibits and, and didn't just give it to someone else to do. So I like doing that. But it would it would have been very very difficult to do myself, and uh, it, it was an amazing team. And we had to do it in two different venues, as it turns out, because of the politics of religion and religion of politics that I referenced. So, can I add something, or uh, you... no? Just kidding. Oh. Go ahead, Joel. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you so much for the talk tonight, but also the experience in Jerusalem, because for me that was. Uh, an incredible eye opener. I mean, for, for me, it was that you're talking about, um, for, first of all, the people who don't know me in the group, I'm Joel Silverstein, I'm in the Jewish Art Salon with Richard and Yona. And we were there in Jerusalem hanging and organizing the show and, you know, pick the works before and stuff. Um, I guess there was, they talk about a watershed moment, the, the moment of being exposed to the culture in Jerusalem. And, you know, we had that incident at the museum and everything and um, that- What happened? What happened? Um, Actually, first, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you because in fact, Joel was front and center. Um, the, the main venue for the museum is called the, the Machtarot Museum. It's the Museum of um, Resistance Fighters. Mm. And the exhibition was opening mm. uh, shortly after Yom Kippur. So that, Aye. okay, so we're, but the, and it, and, and the location is within the ultra Orthodox part of Jerusalem. And during um, Chola Moed, the, the, the period in Sukkot be, between the, the first couple and the last few days, it is a museum particularly visited by the traditional community. And the museum director was very concerned that certain things would be offen offensive to that community, to a nutshell. We had just finished hanging. You saw Joel's painting. I mean, it's huge and it's colorful. Think of this when you're entering a whatever, you don't even have to imagine the ex exhibition space. That's the first image that greets you, kabam, your eyes are gonna be knocked out. And we had just finished and it's not easy to hang. The director comes by, looks at it and says, no, 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 that's gotta come down. Because Gal Gadot, may she, who is now going to be Cleopatra, right. um, because Wonder Woman has naked shoulders. Aye. Right. Joel was willing, as not every artist would be, he said, you know, I can make a little flap to cover, cover her up. No, 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 no. And I had a long argument with him. Um, I said, you're, you're acting, this is not the Soviet Union. You're acting like a fascist. He said, I'm not being a fascist. I said, excuse me, mm -hmm. you just told me that I can't hang this painting. And by the way, I had gotten a preliminary review from them and it had listed several paintings that could not be hung. This was not among them. So it's not just that there was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, when you, you know, won't let something be shown. What's the word Answered. I'm looking for? Censor? Censor, right. It's yeah. not just, he said, Zoto censura, which is the word in Hebrew, right? Censura, censorship. Um, I said, yes, it is. It's not just that there was, but that uh, if you want to censor, at least do so in advance so I can pre think where things are going to go. You can't do it now after I've hung it. So that's, that's what the issue was. Right. But there was a second oh. site venue. It worked out visually it happened to work out well because the other site 
which was where the 14 stations of the cross were and so on. Oh, it, yeah, it, yeah. It created a kind of natural sort of chapel, you might say. Right, right. And in the end, Joel's painting was outside that space. And it, 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 the wall was fine for it, except you couldn't step back and really see it. So he was disadvantaged that way. Um, but uh, he's still talking to me anyway. Yeah. So I interrupted you, Joel. Well, I, I just wanted to say, actually, it added to that whole experience. It really yeah. did. Because what happened was I got smacked in the face between like American Jews and Israeli Jews. And, <laughs> and the whole thing about Jewish art, like that, 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 that um, kind of uh, chaos and fire, the, the energy uh, that that creates. And so I think for the people who are listening tonight that don't know about the salon, it's, it's, it, is, it is creating a space for Jewish artists to feel comfortable with Jewish identity and Jewish issues and culture and stuff like that. But it's really about what Jewish art will look like for the future. And I think that trip to Israel really like was a smack in the face for me. And I just want to thank you. It was like a great experience, so. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can, can Excuse I, can me, I, when I, was this trip? I missed the date. This 2017. year? 2017. No, 2017, uh, fall of 2017. Uh, 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 so a little over three years ago. Right. Richard, you were going to say yeah, something. I, I just want to add to this that, you know, this is an underlying problem uh, that contemporary artists, or let's put it this way, many contemporary artists uh, face, Jewish contemporary artists, and that is that we're operating in a really a different realm than, 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 than pieces of our audience are. So there's, there's an amazing disjunction going on here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've lived with the disjunction for so many years that I almost don't notice it, but when then you come up against something like Joel, what Joel had to go through um, uh, back there in Jerusalem, you see it in spades. And that is, we are making art that deeply loves and deeply appreciates uh, the centuries of Jewish experience and Jewish literature, but we're doing so from a essentially a postmodernist perspective. Um, and our and our audience is not up to us yet. And you know. Um, for some reason, uh, I think just fell out of my library. I was standing here and I looked at a book and it I pulled it out and I'm, oh my, what is this? It's, um, it, it's a Mod Mod Modigliani. And it was a Modigliani book. And then it was, then I looked at a couple of other books I had and look at his news. So he had an exhibition in 1917 in Paris. Paris 1917 at the beginning of the 20th century. Paris, the, the, the hotbed of the avant-garde. His exhibition of nudes was shut down by the police. Yep. Yeah. I remember because and, I used and, to and, give and, tours. And, 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 yeah. and, and so that's called a disjunction, you know, and he kept on making the paintings. He basically made his, all, all of his famous nudes in a basically a two year period of time. He kept on doing what he had to do, but really couldn't show them publicly because there was a disjunction between his vision of what was permissible. And by the way, one of his main um, sins was showing pubic hair. Oh, I mean, they were, they, they, believe me, by today's standards, these are hardly lascivious uh, images, but it goes to show you that artists have to keep on doing what they're doing and, and, and just deal with the fact that sometimes their audience is not ready for them at all. Uh, there are many of, of, of Degas monoprints, which were, some of which were actually destroyed by his family after he died, and some of which have only been recently shown because they were of women in brothels. So it it's, it's, it's kind of goes with the lay of the land. And I think we Jewish artists who insist upon uh, uh, honestly and forthrightly encountering this precious material of Jewish subjects, we just have to keep on making the art we do. And you know what? If the art doesn't get it, if, if the audience doesn't get it, and the audience refuses to see it now, you got to keep on doing it. That's. That, well, I do. Is, I do want to remind you. Just what we got to do. I do want to remind you, of course, and and you're right, Richard. It's not just an issue for Jewish art and Jewish artists. I think uh, of uh, 
uh, Mr. Giuliani, who uh, you may you may have heard his name. He was once mayor of New York. I think, yes. of, I think of, of the exhibition where um, I'm blank on his name, the Nigerian artist. Plantation. It's uh, Chris Ophelia. No. Chris right. Ophelia. Exactly Ophelia, right. right? Chris so oh, it's the, oh, it's the virgin the, uh, child, the and virgin she's got elephant the the poop on her nipples, which it's she right. saw as, of course, completely offensive. Right. Uh, because it, of course, in Nigeria we have the phrase, it comes from Yiddish, to say someone stepped in shit means that someone had really good luck. So <laughs> in Nigeria, it's exponentially like that. Elephant poop <laughs> is really good luck. So it's a it's a positive symbol to have placed on the virgin's nipples. It was nothing insulting or negative or sacrilegious about it. Or I think of Andre Serrano, his pissed Christ, and uh, how I believe that also offended Mr. Giuliani, uh, as it did so. a few others. Right. Um, Send him to but, uh, of course, it was part of a series that he was doing that involved body liquids. And if the whole idea of Renaissance art with respect to the image of Jesus is that it's to humanize him, well, if we want to emphasize his human and not his divine side, then if we want to continue that idea forward, we have to include the fact that he did pee and he <laughs> did bleed and he drank his mother's milk as a baby so a, a Christ image immersed in urine or immersed in blood or immersed in milk is about that. And it's not about trying to be sacrilegious, but yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's an issue that well, is not likely to die before no. any of us here yeah. have. No, no, no. We have time maybe Corey, for one more question. I have a question. Um, Roberto. How are you, Ori? How's everyone doing? Uh, I'm just curious, I'm building upon uh, Joel's experience, what was the, the reaction of the Israeli audience in general? To, uh, to I, I personally cannot tell you because, I mean, I was there at the opening, as far as I could tell people, and I went back a few times in the next couple of days, people seemed to be interested in it. We had, um, as a matter of fact, while we were doing the installation, there was a bunch of soldiers who came in to see the Museum, the Machtarot Museum, and I got them to help us carry in these big bags of salt yeah. that, that um, ah, Gloria yeah. Finkel had so ordered. Um, and they, meanwhile, were looking around and said, hey, what is this? This is really cool stuff. Tell me, Bill, about this exhibit. So all I can say is that the few young Israelis whom I spoke to while it was still in process really liked it. They liked what they were seeing. Um, and uh, I don't know thereafter how the Israeli audience responded. And the night of the opening, of course, as I said, there were a dozen different exhibitions opening simultaneously. So it's not as if everyone was focused and concentrated in, in our exhibit. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I know that there was a lot of interest from the press and in part they were interested because of the controversy. Um, so there were a couple of, of uh, journalists who interviewed me. I never saw the articles, but I gather there were articles about it. All right. Well, I told Uri at the beginning of this that this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship that we're going to have him back, uh, please God, many times to Charter Oak Cultural Center because you just, uh, you have been a gift to us. I, I can't thank you enough. It was just a brilliant, brilliant talk and the art is just so powerful. And um, I, I really thank you from the bottom of my heart and we hope to see you back very, very soon. We're going to be- Well, it's easy when you've got good art to talk about it. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so everyone, I wanna wish you a good night and a happy Thanksgiving and blessings galore. And uh, hopefully you'll join us for from Charter Oak with Love on two on Monday night, the 23rd. And we'd love to see you there and all kinds of events that are coming up for Charter Oak. So please, you know, look at our calendar and get on our mailing list. And uh, we really appreciate all your support, especially during these very difficult times. So and thank you all, everyone. and thank Don, and thanks Jacques thank so much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.